I'll do the legislative one first. Okay. And, oh, the article says Kansas Supreme Court impeachment bill advances in state senate. And um, mm -hmm. Voice. so during the president's presidency of Andrew Johnson, he was taken to trial for the accusations of high crimes and misdemeanors, according to Article 2 of the United States Constitution. This trial gained a reputation, and it was the only impeachment in American history until 131 years later when Bill Clinton also went to trial for impeachment. While there, this article isn't about, it's like not about impeachment for state presidents, the Kansas Supreme Court has recently advanced an impeachment bill in the state Senate. In this particular case, particular case, the bill would establish new standards for the impeachment of justices, and it's the Senate Bill 439. As of now, the United States Constitution states that the only guidelines for an impeachable offense are treason, bribery, or other high crimes and misdemeanors, which was like the crimes that President Johnson was accused to have committed. However, lawmakers are working on trying to make a new list of impeachable offenses. This would include attempting to subvert fundamental laws and introduce arbitrary behavior, and attempting to assert the power of the legislative or executive branch of government. In a recent debate, Senator Michael Holmes cited two examples of potential impeachable offenses. The 2014 decision by the Supreme Court to allow a Democratic Senate candidate off the ballot without forcing a party name to, to part, without forcing the party to the middle replacement, and to allow uh, Justice allowing her husband to hold a political fundraiser that she did not attend at their home. And the Democrats are against this bill. So basically, that's like all it was. But. Okay. Um. Can you slow down just a little bit? Okay. <laughs> it's hard for me to. It's hard for me to keep up because I haven't heard anything about this one. For a so. It's hey Nicholas. Hi. We're doing the current events right now. Um, okay, so they're trying to change the Kansas law so that they can impeach a Kansas senator. Or uh, yeah. Well, like yeah, or like just kind of in general, like they just want to like make new standards for how like what like. I don't know if, if, like, they're planning on, like, taking it farther, but right now it's just the state of Kansas, and they're trying to, like, it's, I don't really, yeah, like, they're trying to change the, um, like, list of how, like, what you can be impeached for. Is this for, like, presidential impeachment or just? No, it's just right now, it's just for justices, not senators. Because if it was for presidential So, okay, so, um, yeah, it would have to come through Congress in order to change anything for the presidency. Um, so impeachment of court justices? Supreme Court justices? Yeah, I think, um, yeah, I think. It's the, the it's, in the article it just, said ju just says justices, justices, but it's the Kansas Supreme Court, or the, yeah. it, so, yeah. Well, right. justices are, are judges, so they would be Supreme Court, yeah. so impeaching Supreme Court. Here, um, wow. Go ahead, Robin. Aren't they trying to create, um, aren't they trying to create time limits? I thought it was. I heard something about time, they're trying to make it to where there's time limits on how long a justice can sit. Um, that may be, but that wouldn't be impeachment. True. Yeah. Hmm. And they're standing so really trying to impeach. Are they trying to impeach? Wait, what? Kansas. They're in Kansas. They want to impeach justices in Kansas. So, are they just looking for another way that you can easily dispose of people? 
who they decide they don't like anymore. That's essentially what they're doing. So that could be a <laughs> result. To close them out, they can just. Yeah, because how often do uh, incumbents or judges get voted out? Very rarely. Very rarely. How often do people research the people that they're voting for when you go to the election uh, poll? Very rarely. Very rarely, yes. And, okay, um, in Alaska it's pretty easy. You might have a couple referendums on the ballot and you might have, you know, a list of 10 judges. In California you might have 100 referendums on the ballot and sometimes do. So to research all of those and then to research the judges on top of it, most people, most people just check yes uh, most people are pretty apathetic and don't don't know how important their votes are oh and look at that quote <laughs> by adolf hitler yes and and the quote of the day how fortunate for government that the people they administer don't sing so do you think that's uh, applicable in this case in Okay, so there are only a couple of us in this class who can vote or who have voted. Um, and, you know, it's, it's hard to vote. It's hard to vote and know um, everything about a candidate or candidates in, in order to make a good decision. So thank you, Brianna. I think that's a great, really interesting thing. Uh, so now for the media current event, mm -hmm. I actually like have two articles. One like I think I just like I don't really I just like found it and but it's um, the NAACP, which is the National Association for Advancement of Colored People. President connects Trumpism to the Ku, Ku Klux Klan, and then there was another one uh, that there's I don't actually know how I found this. But it's just like, I think I typed in current events or something. And it's like, uh, in Tallahassee, there were uh, flyers, Ku Klux Klan flyers, like, just this week. Or, it was published March 28th, so, like, during this weekend. But the, the this is, like, about the other one. Um, but, so, in 1886, the Ku Klux Klan was founded. This group of people supported white supremacy, white nationalism, and anti-immigration. The Ku Klux Klan was very prominent throughout the southern United States throughout the late 1860s and wanted to overthrow Republican state governments during the Reconstruction era, era directing hatred especially to African American leaders. The Ku Klux Klan began to die down in the early 1870s. In 1915, it resurfaced again, and this time they were especially opposed to Catholics and Jews. And then beginning in 1950, um, another Ku Klux Klan was founded, and they're like the ones that are still today, and um, they're opposed to the civil rights movement and often using violence to suppress activists. As of 2012, there's estimated 5,000 to 8,000 um, KKK members. An article published by Nicholas Bolasby on March 25, 2016, the NAACP um, president connected Trumpism to the Ku Klux Klan. Donald Trump, who is running in the 2016 president, presidential elected election, um, wait, this is the right one. Okay, yeah. Um, on the presidential, oh, um, on the Republican side, is said to display many characteristics similar to the KKK. In the article, the president Cornell William Brooks says that, um. The KKK came into power in the 1920s, grew massively in numbers with this toxic mix of public appeal, a kind of unpatriotic or un-American patriotism, and number one, a kind of thin Christianity and a virtually anti-immigration sentiment. Fast forward to 2016, and we have Americans who find themselves in the throes of economic anxiety and economic insecurity in the wake of a rising tide of income inequality. There being an appeal to on the basis of anti-immigration campaigns. He then goes on to label Republican presidential frontrunner Donald Trump's campaign as a form of demagoguery. 
say that? I'm not sure. And connected its appeal to the history of the KKK. Later in the article, he, Brooks states that we are most concerned about this anti-immigration appeal. This authorization tone and tenor, particularly at this moment, when you see the diversification and expansion of the American electorate. Okay. So, this, the writer, any questions or comments? No, he's just like comparing them, like the similarities, I guess. And he's finding similarities because some of the demographics of this time are the same? Um, what is that? Mean? Uh, economic disparity? Yeah, I think, I, yeah, I think so. Yeah. Okay. All right, questions, comments? There is a tremendous controversy surrounding Donald Trump as a presidential <laughs> candidate from all sides, uh, you know, from his party and from the opposing party. <laughs> and they did have the incident where the KKK has endorsed Donald Trump and I wonder if that had anything to do with the um, with the article that was written. Did it say? Uh, I didn't say. It was probably, it was probably, it was probably where it was um, he said he didn't know anything about David Duke mm -hmm. or the KKK or white supremacy, but he the, and then they showed that he he knew about David Duke. There was a he was actually on video talking about it years ago, talking about David Duke, so he knows who he is. Okay. Yeah, if you watch that particular interview, um, he was very convincing. He was, he's like, who, who is David Duke? I mean, he, it looked like he, you know, whether he remembered David Duke right at that moment or not, but it, it appeared that he was telling the truth in the full article, in the full interview. Yeah, well, he said he didn't know anything about why. Yeah, he said he didn't know anything about white supremacy and, you know, this, I can't remember the, the anchor's name, but he was like, I'm talking about the KKK. And he just, like, he sidestepped the whole KKK thing. But, you know, just the whole the whole problem with Donald Trump is, you know, like you said, he loves the poorly educated and people that aren't even, I don't even know why, why there's so many people that like him. It's crazy. Well, uh, you know, he... What's, what's interesting and what's going to be even more interesting this fall is that he has, that he is speaking to a lot of people. And there are a lot of people who can relate to some of the things that he does speak of. And right there, as Brianna said, the economic disparity, I think, is one of the keys to the reasoning behind that. Because there is a tremendous economic disparity, and it's growing. And it's been growing for years. The middle class is disappearing. So it's, it's completely crazy to me because of the fact that he's a billionaire, and he, you know, and he spouts it off all the time. And it's like it, I don't understand that, you know. But a lot, it's mainly but a lot of poor people that in like the economic disparity there for him. But it makes no sense. It's like he's obviously going to be with the other billionaires. It, it's crazy. <laughs> and there are many, many opinions. I'm, and I'm fortunate. I'm very happy that we can express our opinions in this class. So I thank you for that, Nicholas. Any comments, questions? Yes. <laughs> Not really about her article, but I know a lot of people are voting for Donald Trump because he's pro guns. He he appeals to a lot of uneducated people. He, people think that because he's a billionaire, he knows what he's doing. He'll know how to run the country better. Mm -hmm. uh, personally, I think he's an idiot, but it's my opinion. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's going to be a really fascinating election cycle. Um, 
It's already fascinating, but. <clears throat> Did you hear him on the O'Reilly show last night? No, no we don't get TV. Uh, what was it all about? Well, they were asking, like, his response to, uh, he's talking about building the wall between us and Mexico. Mm -hmm. And uh, Hillary was like, how high do you have to build the wall to block the internet? And he's like, well, that doesn't even relate to what I'm talking about, so I don't even have to answer that. And he kind of, like, shunned off every question that was thrown off at him and went off on a tangent, trying to, I'm a billionaire businessman, so I know what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. Well, he's a billionaire businessman. You don't get yeah. that way unless you are like that. Yeah. I, you should meet the senators. Yeah. And, yeah. <laughs> he was, he was uh, you know, well, his, his dad, you know, he inherited a bunch of money. I thought it was really funny when he stood there at that press conference with his uh, the Trump stakes, the Trump water. All of his, uh, all of his failed businesses, you know, he started that little mortgage company, I think it was like 2008, right at the, you know, beginning of the financial crisis. You know, they've got Trump University, it's, it's crazy, but people even think that he's a good businessman. Like, you no, know, it's only by his fault that he is. Uh, I don't know, I don't know that he could survive this long if he, if he didn't have good people in the right places and, so, you know, sometimes you can get lucky, but you can't get lucky all the time. But yeah, it's uh, it's tough. Yeah, it's tough. It's just, okay. Like, Thank you, you Brianna. A businessman like that is running because yeah. businessmen go for profit, and what's good for them. This businessmen have a whole different take on things. And he's pretty um, like hard. That's a big part of his. Oh yeah. Campaign is I'm an accomplished businessman. Yeah. So that's why a lot of people want an accomplished businessman running our country. Well. Yeah, and that's the question voters are going to have to answer this fall. Okay, so we are going to um, move on. We're going to finish Chapter 2 today. So, Atlantic Charter, the last thing that I wanted to talk about regarding the Atlanta Char Atlantic Charter was the fact that it was condemning the aggression, right? Um, and one of the reasons for this is because the U-boats had fired and actually hit a U.S. destroyer. And so FDR had asked Congress to arm merchant ships. And so they could um, support the Allies in that. Okay? Was there anything else? Did anybody have, have any other questions about this? Fly. Then leave selective service. You know, we're still working under selective service on that now. And Lend Lease program is still um, basically in effect because we have we have bases all over the world. Yes. Yes, it was. Um, you can see the slide, right, Nicholas? Yes. Okay, perfect. All right, so we've got Pearl Harbor. Pearl Harbor Day is which day? December 7th. Mm -hmm. And did we cover this already? No. Yes or no? Not that I remember. Okay. That's what I, I thought so. Um, so Pearl Harbor Day, the coming of war... Japan continues to grow uh, with the e greater East Asia co-prosperity sphere, right? And seeing the U.S. as blocking their legitimate uh, rise to power, okay? And so Japan, I really thought we had covered this. I think we did, uh, yeah, I don't think it's just... Yeah, they had signed the Tripart Act with Germany and Italy creating the military alliance, right? Um, and then in 1941, overran Indochina, which was part of... France. Yes, Vichy, France. And December 8th, we declared war on Japan, right? And at this time, all of the uh, news coming out of Europe was bad. 
and now we're fighting a war with very few ships. Right? The War Powers Act um, granted president the president unprecedented authority over all aspects of war. Okay, so what they're doing, they're working to support the war. And in order to do that, in what they are thinking to win this war, they need to do whatever it takes to win this war. Am I am I right? Would you agree? Okay. So in order to do that, he did expand the presidency dramatically. Okay? And he did things that people were pushing back on, um, not necessarily in the very beginning, but they were pushing back uh, because there were there were some things that, like, you're really overstepping your bounds here. You know, no other president has done anything like this. Okay, so uh, 15 million people volunteered and were drafted. 350,000 women by the end of the war um, were working on the war in the war effort. Okay, and they moved, this is when they moved into the Pentagon. Of course, which was the, it is the largest, is it still the largest? At the time, it was the largest office building in the world. And I want to say it might still be. I, I could be wrong, but um, at that time, it was the very largest in the world. He created the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Okay? Um, you have the... You'll hear about this whenever you hear about uh, a president talking to his Joint Chiefs of Staff. It's, you know, the, the highest ranking officer in the U.S. Armed Forces, the president's military advisor. Um, you know, you have a lot of different people, Army, Navy, Air Force, um, you know, Secretary of War. And so that's a, a new not organization, but a new uh, melding of the minds, right? And in order to organize for victory, you have to organ you have to organize the entire country, because we were not prepared for war. Um, I don't know that we've ever been prepared for a war that we have entered. Um, so they are scrambling. And in order to scramble, they're pulling from all directions. And so they're bringing people in. Pre people are trying new things. Kind of like the New Deal, right? He went from uh, Dr. New Deal to Dr. Win the War. Right? And so the War Manpower Commission supervised mobilization of men, women, and, and the military. Okay? Plus agriculture. The War Production Board allocated materials. Right and limited the production of civilian goods. Okay, this is the reason. One of the reasons that uh, things were scarce during the war. You had meatless days. You had um, no bumpers on your cars. You had, um, you know, growing up during war years, you had like one pair of shoes. Okay, uh, the National War Labor Board. Okay, so they were. Mediating any disputes that happen between um, in labor, especially with unions, and and that because they couldn't stop production. Uh, the Price Administration, Office of Price Administration, was extremely important. Why is that? Cyberland, any ideas? Didn't it put a cap on all prices? It did. It mandated certain prices for goods, okay? And what they were trying to do is control inflation. Because if you hit inflation, you see during uh, the Civil War how inflation hurt the war efforts, right? Remember? Okay, so strict price controls to check the inflation. In 1942, 33% of the economy was in war production, up from 15%. It more than doubled. 
in war production. Okay, and this is one of the reasons that uh, Stalin says we won the war, is because we, although he made fun of FDR and and the fact that we had we were such a consumer nation, and you know, I mean, we were we were supplying the world with toasters, right? But those toaster factories became munitions factories, you know. So they retooled and and good or bad, the way that they organized the war, they bumped this country and they they bumped the production to the um, to the necessary. Uh, level that it needed to be in order to win. Okay? And so the size of the government also doubled. In 1949, 9% of the budget was on defense spending because where where was it prior to that? New Deal. New Deal. Exactly. New Deal and just general um, government, right? 1945. 46%, almost half of the budget, is organized for the war. So he was throwing all of the money, not all of the money, okay, only 46% of the money, <laughs> significant amount of the money, right, and all of his efforts to the war, okay? So the budget for the government went from $9 billion to $98 billion. Okay. <laughs> that's, a, that's an incredible increase. Number of federal employees, $1.1 million to $3.8 million. Okay. So we see these, these numbers that are almost nonsensical, right? But it's all to support the war effort. The executive branch is the one that grew the most, okay? And again, uh, the biggest corporations generally got the most um, war contracts, which at 46% of the national budget, how do you think those com corporations were doing? They were doing very, very well, yes. All right, so the war economy... The U.S. spent $360 billion to defeat the Axis. That was 10 times what they spent in World War I. All right? Now, why do you think it costs that much? Okay. That's one big piece of it. What else? Nicholas, you have any ideas? Technology, yes, the Wizard's War, right? So there's kind of inventing and then uh -huh. building. Right. New expensive yes. Equipment. New equipment, <laughs> inventions, technology. Is there adjusting for inflation too? Is the dollar still the same then as it was in World War One? Um. That's a great question. It is in World War II dollars. So, no, it, it really wasn't adjusted. These numbers aren't really adjusted. Um, that's a great question. A great question. So, um, they also had to pay people. Think of how many more millions of people were working. Right? So, um, you have the, the new research, you have them dumping money and, I mean, millions of dollars into research universities, right? Plus, think of the cost to get, <laughs> to get the planes from the Midwest to Europe. Yeah, overseas for transporting. Right, okay. Or how about get the planes from there to Hawaii? Right? Or Australia. Okay? All right, so they also built cities. Uh, our friend Wayne, as his father was working on the, uh, the Manhattan Project, 
they created a city out of fields in Washington State. And it, I mean, there were a few farms in the area because as a boy, he would go and play in the empty farms, in the farm houses. And, uh, but there were 20,000 people living there by the time he left. Okay, so the government built it, right? They built those, those houses for their employees on the Manhattan Project. And that's just one of the sites for the Manhattan Project. You've got Alamogordo, you have all these different sites. Um, not a ton of different sites, but you have more than one, okay? Urban uh, population increased by 36% because that's where industry was. If you were gonna build a machine, you were gonna be in a city, right? There was a no strike pledge after Pearl Harbor. Um, so inflation, does everybody understand how inflation works? Okay. More money and less goods equals inflation. Okay, so I have more money, but I can't buy X. I can't buy this book because there aren't enough of them. So I'll pay more, which means there's more inflation. Right? Deflation. You have less money, but more goods. So the production is too high. Right? And uh, more money plus more goods equals flat pricing. So if they equal, you know, they rise at the same time. But if you have an imbalance at any time, you're either going to get inflation or deflation. Right? Okay. So... The pricing in 1942 was going up about 2% a month. And FDR got the authority from Congress to freeze wages, to freeze prices, and to freeze rents. Okay? To stop that. And so, as they have millions of people on their payroll in the federal government, they could control those, uh, the wages too, right? So, they're able to really work on that and that was to keep that inflation rate at a at a rate that the economy wasn't going to collapse okay now that is that is something that is unprecedented in a presidential authority right you've only seen this other any other time during a time of war okay because we are a market economy. Remember laissez-faire? Leave it alone. Leave it alone, it'll fix itself. Right? So this is where you have um, you have this propensity to overstep the presidential <coughs> bounds. Okay? And the Wizard War. Talked a little bit about it. Think of all of the, the inventions that happened. Um, you had scientists, you had Psychologists who were actually developing propaganda. Okay, it wasn't is it wasn't it wasn't your marketing campaign of today. These were the psychologists who were focusing and and uh, trying to use it for the propaganda to really work with people's heads <laughs> in order to to make them believe whatever they were trying to say. Right, um, mathematicians were code breakers. Think of the Enigma machine. And unfortunately, I didn't get some of the photographs from World War II into this slideshow because I, uh, I have a lot of other photographs. But the new ones that I have, if anyone's interested, I can send you some. But we have the Enigma machine and we have uh, walking sticks from POW camps. Uh, it's pretty powerful and I will probably play that slideshow as we show the artifacts in the classroom. Okay, so uh, you have jet aircraft, you have fuses, you have rocket weapons, you have sonar, you have radar, you have lasers and insecticides. A lot of these came about in World War II for the war effort, right? Um, penicillin. 
came out at this time. So all of these things not only were costing money, of course, but they were changing how the, the normal everyday life of your average American because there wasn't anybody who didn't use penicillin after World War II unless you couldn't afford it and, you know, unless you couldn't afford it. But it was, it was I mean, it was ubiquitous within the, the medical realm after World War II for everyone. So medical care, you know, you had MASH units, the Mobile Auxiliary Surgical Hospital, antibiotics, uh, anti-malarial drugs, lung surgery, heart surgery. Uh, your life expectancy actually rose during the war, which doesn't really make sense because you have all these people dying off, but your life expectancy goes up because they've developed so many new um, medical procedures and and things that could improve your life enough to raise your life expectancy, right? Um, you have propaganda, politics, sustain uh, unity. FDR was trying to manage public opinion. So they would censor things, um, not unlike today. Afghanistan, your emails and, and correspondence was censored, right? Um, you also had the, going back to the Wizards War, you had the atomic bomb, okay? Einstein had come over and told FDR or high government officials that Germany was developing this kind of a bomb. And so the United States started the Manhattan Project to counter that. All right. Um, you had, so the, the propaganda, Office of Censorship, the Office of War Information, so they're very, being very strategic about what they're um, giving out, what information is, is being uh, sent out to the people, and what information you're allowed to, to say. Okay? And so one of the goals of that was to keep morale up, and one of the goals of that was to um, have people support this, this effort. Because they knew that going from zero to 160 was not going to be possible unless people really pulled together and, and worked together on it. Does that make sense? Okay. All right, so the battlefront, 1942 to 44, um, Soviet manpower, okay, millions of people, and American industrial might, along with some diplomacy that was following, is what they're attributing, uh, the t turning the tide of the war, okay? So after Pearl Harbor, the British and American officials agreed to focus first on Germany and then go after Japan, right? Stalin, who was fighting a thousand mile front, he was fighting two thirds of the Nazi army. Right? Think of that. Think of one third of the army took over pretty much all of Europe. One third of the Nazi army. Almost all of continental Europe. Two thirds of the army is hitting Stalin. How do you think Stalin felt about that? Pretty angry. Angry and afraid, yes. Who was he angry at, Nicholas? Probably Hitler, I would say. Because Hitler's the one sending the troops at him. Yeah, he was, a, he was angry at Hitler, but he was also angry at Churchill. Because he kept asking Churchill for a second front to kind of weed some of those troops off of his, his thousand mile front. Right? And so, he was, he was totally getting hammered. Um, they stopped Germany in the Battle of Stalingrad. Battle of Leningrad, how many people do you think died? <laughs> Civilian and military. Garrett can't say because we looked it up together. Any, take a wild guess. Keep going. Keep going. 
One point one million. One point one million. That was that was Stalingrad military deaths. Stalingrad military and civilian casualties were two and a half million. Mm -hmm. That was one battle. Yeah, one battle. Okay, this is what Stalin's fighting. So if you look up the number of cities in the United States, there are ten cities over one million people today. Actually in twenty fourteen. So, one battle of 1.1 million, and those numbers are kind of fluid. Like, the 850,000 is what was highlighted in the Battle of Leningrad, because that was the bloodier battle. The Battle of Stalingrad was 750,000, but those are military, right? And, and like I said, I mean, like Garrick said, you know, the, the estimates are off because... One, you can't get good estimates um, at the time. And you, that, that's taking out 1.2 million is, the, is Dallas. Okay? So think of one battle taking out the population of Dallas. I don't want to get half of my hometown. My hometown is like 3, I think 3.1 million people. Yeah. And that's, what town is that? Riverside, California. Okay. So, so basically L.A., right? Is that what you're saying? Well, LA, I think L.A. County has LA. 13 million people. Yeah. Yeah. So, so you look so at that. A lot of people. Yeah, 3 million people. So you take out the Battle of Leningrad and the Battle of Stalingrad, and you've wiped out Riverside, California. All right, that's just two battles. So he's... That's crazy. Yeah, yeah. Out of the top 20 battles, the bloodiest battles in the war, all but one of them were fought where? On the Eastern Front, in by the Soviets. Okay, all but one of the bloodiest battles. So, yeah, Stalin wasn't too happy with Churchill and FDR. Why didn't Churchill open a second front? Why didn't he do that? Why didn't he help uh, Russia more? Churchill was from Britain. Churchill? Yeah, he didn't have as much manpower as as Stalin, but also he didn't trust him at all. Remember, Stalin in Germany had signed the pact. And then Germany negated the pact when they attacked. Right? But Churchill is like, yeah, I don't, I don't know that I want to do that. And Roosevelt sided with Stalin. Or, excuse me, with Churchill. Right? So, uh, twice... Probably more times than that, but Stalin had asked for the second front, um, and they weren't going to open it. So they focused first, um, the U.S. focused first there um, in Africa and in France and uh, and in that region, okay? And Italy, Italy took years to overcome. It took over a year for them to get from Sicily, the bottom of Italy, to Rome. You can drive that in a day. Okay? It's a long day, but you can drive from, from Rome to the tip of, of Italy in a day. Okay? So they were, it was a uh, horrendous, it was horrendous fighting. And the Italian army had surrendered and had shot Mussolini, or killed him. Yeah, with the piano wire. Okay? I think they did both, <laughs> just to make sure he was gone. <laughs> From what I understand, um, in 43 and 44, they sent thousands of bombers over Germany. They hit Hamburg, they hit Cologne, they hit Dresden, okay? Um, and they had some pretty heavy casualties, 35,000 in Hamburg, uh, 60,000 in Cologne and Dresden. Did it change the war effort? It did not significantly change the war effort. They 
well, looking back, you could say that uh, that they hit too many casual, uh, too many civilians. Okay, and it didn't. One of the goals of that fire bombing, that well, it created firestorms, right? This bombing. So one of the goals of that was so that um, the civilians would say, "Enough is enough." We're going to stop working for you, Hitler. Um, didn't work there. It hadn't worked in Britain when Germany had done that in London. Right? It, it wasn't effective. You'll see it used again in Vietnam. Right? Okay, so in 43, in July, the Russians started the offensive. Okay? And by mid-44, the Russians were slowly eating up Poland, okay? So they were pushing back and they were they were able to stop. Uh, they had been able to stop the Nazis and head back, um, back west, okay? And on June 6th of 44 is when, as they were starting to come west, they opened, uh, Churchill and FDR opened that second front where? The major second front was where? Normandy, yes. D-Day. It was D-Day. Okay, June 6th of 1944, D-Day. 200,000 troops in the largest armada ever assembled. Okay, hit the shores of Normandy, France. And it wasn't just one spot. There were multiple beaches that they hit. Um, the Germans were prepared and they were waiting for them. And they just... Again, it's one of those things like, like Stalin, you just kept sending waves of men in, and this is one of the reasons the casualties were so high in Normandy, and one of, one of the reasons that Soviet casualties were so high is because they just kept pushing men um, that were expendable. I'm not saying that the men at, on Normandy beaches were expendable, but it was just wave after wave, and the first guys off those... Uh, off those boats, most of them went down on the on the beaches where the Germans had the most uh, armaments. Okay, and then you've got the Battle of the Bulge, where the Allies uh, prepped for this full-scale assault into Germany. Right, Hitler was driving into the Allies' uh, line. Okay, and it was this bulge. He was, he was trying to bulge through this allied line, right? And the Battle of the Bulge lasted um, a little over a month, and it was the largest U.S. casualties in the war. 19,000 Americans went down in the Battle of the Bulge. And you'll see some pictures from that here that I have. Okay, so here you have the, the allied advances. You have the Axis powers on this map, major battles. Stalingrad, Kursk. Kursk was the largest tank war. Um, 800 tanks on one side and 600 tanks on the other side. I mean, phenomenal numbers of tanks, right? Um, you've got Poland, and, and look at Poland where they've come come through one direction and they're going back through another, okay? They've been hammered. There were Polish officers who escaped and they were flying uh, some of these bombers over uh, Germany. And the RAF didn't really think very highly of the Polish um, military flyers. Uh, you know, the pilots, they didn't think very highly of them until they started seeing what they could produce. But think about it. Um, they had a lot invested, right? I mean, they had a lot invested. They had family behind. They left their homes behind, everything. And so they were, they were fierce. They were really, really fierce fighters. Okay, and here you have a, a monument uh, to the Battle of the Bulge that's in Beston. Okay, um, there are fields all around, and what's really interesting about this is that 
It's a French mon well, Belgian monument here, uh, dedicated to the American soldiers who fought this war. Okay, and so it has every state, and you can actually walk around at the top of this, and it's like in a star shape. Okay, um, and in the middle of Bastogne, you have an old Sherman tank. Not only that, and you can see uh, see where it's been hit. You can also see there's a Jeep, right? And you can go in and out of these. Uh, the guns are all inoperable, but you can climb in and out of them. And here's Malmedy, and Malmedy is where there was a, it was called the Malmedy Massacre, where 81 U.S. POWs who had surrendered uh, were massacred and most of them at point-blank range. So they were shot right directly in the head um, as they were standing there or, or kneeling there. Um, these were caves, and there are caves in this region where civilians and troops were hiding. Um, this was some fierce, these were some fierce battles here. Okay, And then you get to the Pacific where you have you know, some of the other fiercest battles are in the Pacific. And in May of 42, the Philippines were fa had fallen. The Coral Sea is where this, the Japanese advance had stopped uh, the advance into Australia. Okay? It was a definitive battle. Uh, the Japanese code had actually been broken. And it actually served to... Uh, to create a victory at Midway Island, okay? And the Solomon Islands, so you've got, you have thousands of islands in the Pacific. Many of them are very small, some of them are big. In the Philippines, you have larger islands, but you've got um, all these things going on, and you have, you have a navy that's gone, right? It was eliminated practically at Pearl Harbor. So, you've got the army coming north out of Australia, right? And you have the Navy, or what you have of it from Nimitz, Nimitz is, is the admiral in charge, coming out of Hawaii. So you have this push from Hawaii west and from Australia north, okay? And so um, Nimitz is island hopping. He's, he's reaching an island and taking it over again, all right? Reclaiming it. And um, so you've got... Um, it was MacArthur who was coming north from Australia. So in fall, in the fall of '44, the Japanese fleet finally fell. Okay, but that was the fleet. the um, The Japanese fought until death. Uh, that was that's part of their that was part of their mantra as an officer or a kamikaze pilot. You don't surrender. You die. Right? Surrender is a dishonor to your family. And, and that comes cultural uh, way back, you know, past the samurai. Okay? And so <clears throat> FDR, as he's looking at the, at the war in the Pacific, and he's, he's ramping up again for it. So Germany is tapering off. His first goals was to, his first goal of the war was to really do, a total defeat of the Axis, right? And his other major goal was to set forth, establish a world order that actually would ensure peace, okay? Wilson had tried it, hadn't he? And some nations had signed on to it, but it didn't work. It wasn't effective. FDR wanted an effective world peace. He wanted open trade, and he wanted national self-determination. Ah, national self-determination didn't mean the same thing to FDR as it did to people like Chiang Kai-shek, right? It didn't mean the same thing to Churchill, who didn't want to give up the British Empire, right? He didn't want to give up the colonies. France didn't want to give up their colonies, right? And so um, <clears throat> FDR, knowing that the only reason people are really coming together and, and having a, a mutual goal is because we're fighting this 
horrendous enemy. Okay? So he didn't focus on what they wanted at the end of the war. They focused on getting through the war. All right? Because had they focused on what they wanted to achieve at the end, they would not have, um, the alliances would not have been as strong because there were definite tensions between the goals of the parties involved. All right? So the USSR wanted a permanently weakened Germany. They wanted a sphere of influence in Eastern Europe. They didn't want to be invaded again. Okay? So if you take all of those Eastern European countries and create these puppet governments that are friendly to the Soviets, the Soviets weren't going to get hammered. Right? Strategically, it makes sense, right? I mean, you don't want another opportunity like this uh, again where you're going to have a thousand mile front. Okay, so <clears throat> Churchill also didn't want the U.S. or the USSR to reshape and dominate that post-war world. And, you know, who, who knew who was going to come out on top, right? So in January of 43, FDR and Churchill met in Casablanca, Morocco, okay? And they agreed to this, to keep supporting this unconditional surrender of the Axis, in Cairo, in November of the same year, FDR, Stah, uh, Churchill, and Chiang Kai-shek met. And to keep China in the war, FDR agreed that Manchuria and Taiwan would go back to China. Okay? Plus a free and independent Korea. This is really important to remember. That this was promised to China to keep them in the war. All right, and then the same month after they made this agreement with Chiang Kai-shek, FDR and Churchill went to meet with Stalin in Tehran, Iran. Okay, and they discussed the invasion of France, and that they would divide Germany into zones. Okay, zones of influence. All four of them would get an influence, uh, a section of Germany, right, and reparations on the Reich. They were going to get repaid for some of the problems that had been caused. Okay, um, Stalin also agreed to enter the war against Japan once Hitler was defeated. Okay, because think about it, you've got Stalin. He's he's over here fighting the war and he's he's making his way back into Europe. He's made his way into most of Europe again, right? Does he really want to fight Japan, who's on his other border? Not yet, but he will after the war is over, okay? Um, FDR, after these agreements, after this grand alliance, uh, went back to the, uh, to the election, won 53% of the popular vote. Okay, so here you have um, the description of how, um, how they've gone and how they're leaving the Hawaiian Islands and headed west and how they're headed north out of Australia, okay? And the islands, I mean, think of all of those different islands and think how much it took to take those islands. Think of Iwo Jima, okay? Um, think of Wake Island where oh, the, uh, the casualties on some of these islands were just horrendous and the the POW camps and the um, and the POW treatment was maybe even worse in some cases it was it was significant I don't really know how to uh, describe most of that the GIs in the war for four years 15 million served in the armed forces. 15 more million went to work. Okay? Millions of women, um, minorities, African Americans. There wasn't a family that wasn't involved in the war effort some way. Okay? So, um, some of the GIs would marry overseas. Some of them married overseas and still had wives in the United States. 
Um, my friend, her father, the reason she has her father is because her mother was uh, in France during the war, married a GI, came over to the United States to live with her husband because she now had a baby and her husband already had a wife. I know. <laughs> but this this happened more than once. Um, it it's it, it was a whole new, it was an entirely different world. Right? Um, a lot of migration within the United States, 15 million people you know, working in the military, they're all over the world now. Um, seeing things, meeting people, changing, changing things, right? Millions of women working in the, especially in the defense industry. You have the wax, the waves, and the wasps. Okay, do you know what those are? Okay, no. Uh, Women's Army Corps, wax, right? Waves, women's Air Force, no, women appointed for volunteer emergency service, the Navy, right? The WASP for the Women Air Force, right? And they did all kinds of jobs. They, they uh, were pilots, they were accountants, they, Rosie the Riveter, you know, and that actually was, Rosie the Riveter died in 2011. Her name was Jessica Valenti. Um, she was the poster girl for as Rosie the Riveter. Okay. Um, high school dropouts increased because people went to work. Um, higher education changed. Your radio news came about. Um, more and more news was coming through. So your culture at home uh, was changing. Racism never went away, but the North was starting to have to deal with more of the issues because people were migrating north to work in the factories, right? So they were ha they were forced to to deal with it. The, and the NCAA took advantage of of that, and they said a double V: we want equality, and we want um, the victory against the Axis, right? And they, let's see, FDR issued Executive Order 8802, which was dis prohibiting discrimination in federal agencies. All right, so this was the first one since Reconstruction that dealt with discrimination on the, on the federal level, 8802. So, um, you know, as people are moving in, as, you know, during a war, people are pretty uptight because your families are torn apart. You've got people dying in your family. Um, you know, you probably have a job, but that means that you're, if you're a woman who was used to staying home, that also changes your, your mindset and your mentality. So there was a lot of angst. Um, and not surprisingly, when you get a lot of migration, you have, uh, not just the discrimination, but some of the um, segregation and the the racial tensions, and you know, some led to some riots. Uh, but the war did change significantly um, black civil rights. Okay, and you had with diversity, you had the Code Talkers, the Navajo Code Talkers. Has anyone seen that movie? No. The code talkers, and when I bring in the artifacts and you see the, the pictures, uh, we have some pictures of the code talkers' radios. Okay, There were so few Nav Navajo speakers, like there were less than 100 actual speakers of Navajo. Nobody had ever written it down. Nobody knew Navajo. And this is the reason they were able to meet they were able to, even though they they were Navajo, they took their language and reversed some of the um, the code talkers took and reversed like some of their letters and that, so that even if you knew Navajo, you weren't going to catch the code. Okay, they were Navajos who were tortured in in the Pacific uh, to 
to grant them the code, but they had no idea because the, the code talkers, when they met, they developed, they took and tweaked their language in order to create a new code. And it had never been written down, so this is why they were successful. It's, it's fascinating, okay? Um, you have Mexicans being brought in to um, as temporary workers, not immigrants, but as temporary workers who were going to go back to Mexico after the war effort, but they needed to fill factories. There just weren't enough people to work. Okay? And Japanese-American internment, you also had Aleut internment. You had German-Americans interned. You had Italian-Americans interned. Okay? Japanese-Americans probably got hit uh, some of the hardest because they had to sell everything right, to move. The Aleuts who were moved, they were smaller villages, and so when they moved, but they, <laughs> they moved from, from the chain to southeast, and traditionally, they don't get along, <laughs> like at all, <laughs> because they used to raid each other, right? I mean, they were used to warring. So then you take the Aleuts from the chain and ship them to Clinket territory and it's probably not going to be so good, right? Um, they were allowed to go back after the war, but the Japanese had taken over multiple islands and they were continuing to bomb some of the other islands. So the U.S. military said, we need you get, to get you out of here to keep you safe, to keep you alive. Um, but a lot of the men stayed and served and, and were the reason that the military radio guys, like Wayne's brother, survived because they taught them how to survive in the winter, right, on the, on the Aleutian chain. Forty, or I guess about 800 Aleuts were sent to um, southeast. They, they were moved back after the war, but they probably could have moved back sooner than later. And so, it, you know, all of these internments created um, discrimination. It was it was created some discrimination and created uh, issues that survive even today. You hear about even today. Okay, so the home front. You can see where some of these factories were were built up and how much more. Um, people had moved, especially out west. Okay, so Yalta, where in February of 45, FDR, Stalin, and Churchill met. Okay, Stalin had the military advantage. He had fought that, and he had taken over almost all of Eastern Europe by this point. His thousand-mile front is converging, and compressing, right? Because a thousand miles is is uh, longer than some of like Eastern Europe. So he's converging all his efforts and pushing the Nazis back, right? So he could call a lot of the shots in Yalta. FDR wanted Stalin's help for Japan, uh, and he would do almost anything to get it at this point. So. Stalin agreed to declare war on Japan 90 days after Germany surrendered. Um, Churchill and FDR, would they do with Chiang Kai-shek? They had. Would they do in the Yalta conference? They denied it. They reneged on the contract that they had with Chiang Kai-shek that had kept China in war, right? So, <clears throat> um, for Manchuria from nationalist China. So, in Eastern Europe, there were supposed to be free elections, okay, from the Yalta Conference. The UN, the United Nations, would form from the Yalta Conference. The um, Germany was going to be divided between the U.S., the U.K., and the U.S.S.R. Okay, 
Poland, Poland was seen by uh, Stalin as only a strong and communist Poland would serve the USSR to keep from invading forces coming through again. Okay? So, victory comes in Europe. Do, do you have any questions? The Yalta Conference is extremely important. Okay? Understanding how they were going to outline post-war by finally ad addressing all of post-war this was significant okay so in 45 in the Ruhr Valley the Soviets were coming from the east um, on April 12th of 45 FDR died okay? April 30th of, F of 45 who killed himself Hitler Hitler okay Berlin fell in May uh, May 2nd of 45 Germany surrendered on May 8th of 1945 okay so now Stalin 90 days later is supposed to declare war on Japan right so VE day victory in Europe day um, Truman okay Truman is now the president because FDR had died in office so he inherits this You've got the Potsdam Conference, where it confirmed most of Yalta, um, but that peace treaty actually didn't get signed until 1990. <laughs> right? And so the Potsdam Declaration, FDR, Churchill, and Chiang Kai-shek called for the unconditional surrender of Japan. All right, and then you have the Holocaust, okay? In 1942, it was first leaked, and a lot of people discounted it. Um, some discounted it because how could these kind of atrocities be, um, be happening, right? In World War II, in World War I, uh, they thought, many people thought that they, they had been duped, and uh, the U.S., in the U.S., and so they weren't going to listen. The military knew of the death camps, but they didn't want to bomb them because it would have given away the fact that they could break, they had broken the codes, the German codes. And so um, they, didn't, they didn't stop the Holocaust, okay? The pilots themselves didn't necessarily know uh, because a lot of the pilots say they would have bombed them had they known that uh, the Holocaust was what actually was happening, okay? And also the Allies, they didn't want to waste resources. So um, as they're trying to win the war as quickly as, as possible, this wasn't necessarily going to help do that, okay? And then there were some Jewish organizations who said don't bomb the, uh, the, the camps, all right? Um, Amber, you have current events. Do you have them with you? Okay, we're going to stop here briefly and let Amber do her current events. Or you get ready. Are you ready? Okay. So I'm just going to talk about these slides until you're, you're ready. Okay? So this is the oldest part of Auschwitz. Okay, it was established in 1940. These are actually barracks for Polish, the Polish military, and Germany took that, this over, okay? And the sign means work makes you free. And these are, this is a crematorium that was, uh, the ovens are reconstructed, and they are for burning corpses. So you can see the, um, <clears throat> And I have to say, this is not necessarily gory, but it's uh, pretty intense, these pictures. Are you ready? Okay. Come on over and sit here. We have just a few minutes, so we might do one and then do the next one Tuesday. Okay. So um, my media one is on the New Zealand changing the country New Zealand changing their flag. 
So, um, New Zealand, okay, so I wrote this on the 3rd of March, so I don't know how it is, but New Zealand begins the vote for a change in the country's flag with the postal ballot that will go until the 24th of March when pre preliminary results will be announced. For so long, there's been a major debate over whether to swap flags for multiple reasons, whether it be that their current flag is nearly identical to Australia's or that it is too colonial. It was in 2014 when New Zealand Prime Minister John Key proposed a series of referendums for the flag change. New Zealand residents submitted over 10,000 alternative flag designs, and then a panel narrowed the choices down so the nation could pick its favorite. At present time, the flag bears the British Union jacket with a representation of the Southern Cross, but the vote will be to decide if it should be changed to a new design by Kyle Lockwood, which features New Zealand's native silver fern, a black corner, and the same Southern Cross. Opinion is divided. Clive Sinclair, a war veteran, claimed that the current flag has a lot of history behind it, so it's not something you can discard. While Chris Mullins, another war veteran, said, The new design has links to the past, it celebrates our present, and it also very bravely looks to the future. The event is similar to the changes of the American flag since 1776. When the United States declared independence from Great Britain, the Union changed the Grand Union flag, which bared Britain's flag in a corner and 13 stripes to re represent the 13 colonies, to the Betsy Ross flag, which replaced the British flag with 13 stars and a blue cannon. Since then, the flag has been redesigned with the expansion of the country. Every time a new state is added, a new star is placed on the flag. It's what separates the New Zealand and U.S. flag changes. There has been no major current event in New Zealand that has spurred a revolution, decree, or legislation. In fact, no one country has ever decided to address this kind of issue by popular vote before New Zealand. Those who oppose a new flag go as far as to claim that the vote for change has not come at the right time. Polls, however, indicate that the nation will decide to keep the current flag, but supporters of change have hoped that more people will welcome the alternative. Oh. But awesome. that was my media current event. Okay. Do your other one? Um, so my other one was on the um, prelimi preliminary elections, like Super Tuesday and everything. So, Super Tuesday, a preliminary election to select the candidates for the presidential election was held on March 1st. It is a day where more delegates are at stake than on any other single day in the presidential primary campaign, with nearly a quarter of Republican and around a fifth of Democratic delegates all allocated this year. Alabama, Arkansas, Georgia, Massachusetts, Oklahoma, Tennessee, Texas, Vermont, and Virginia hold contests for both Republicans and Democrats, while Republicans in Alaska and Democrats in Colorado and America Samoa hold caucuses. Businessman Donald Trump won a major victory with the Republican candidate delegates, currently holding 319. Former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton stands as the frontrunner for the Democrats with 1,052, including superdelegates, which are delegates that can support any candidate. Alaska, one of the only states that rely on caucuses, was a part of Super Tuesday. The state is known as a Republican stronghold and had over 130,000 residents registered as Republicans on Tuesday. There was a surprisingly large turnout that resulted in Texas Senator Ted Cruz winning a narrow triumph over Trump with 12 out of the 28 delegates, Florida Senator Mark Rubio having five, despite the endorsement of former Alaska governor and vice presidential nominee Sarah Palin. Super Tuesday has played a large role in presenting the frontrunners of presidential elections. In 1987, George W. Bush came in third in Iowa's caucus, but when Super Tuesday came around, his campaign had blown his opponents out of the water. Bush's campaign organization used fundraisers and the media to their advantage, sending him comfortably in the lead. He went on to become president in 1988, which goes to show that even though he lost some, he won a lot. Could the same hold true for Clump, Trump and Clinton? Okay. All right, questions or comments for Amber? Okay. Yeah, the superdelegates are one of those things that you just never know how it's going to go, right? And delegates, if you get those delegates, they don't necessarily always vote for you, do they? Yeah. No, you've seen those. Well, look, at, think back on the maps that you've seen in history, where the delegates have been divided, the electoral votes been divided, right? Oh, um, the Democratic caucus was on the 26th, which was like three days ago. Bernie Sanders blew Hillary Clinton out of the water in Alaska, so that's what happened. Is Alaska for the Democratic caucus? Okay. Democratic stuff, right? 
everybody watches everything if you are going to be voting. Right? <clears throat> okay, any other questions or comments? So in, in 1776, when the Betsy Ross flag was um, was brought out, you know, you can see the... Is that the one? You can go to the Betsy Ross house in Philadelphia. I was going to say you can see the Betsy Ross flag, but you can't. You can see the one that was over... Where was it? I want to say it was um, Battle of 1812. Battle of 1812. Okay. Great. Thank you, Amber. Please email those. So, okay, great. Yes, you did. <clears throat> um, the next, we're just going to show slides until we get cut off. What day is today? Tuesday? Thursday? Thank you. <laughs> so Thursday, we have class. That'll be the last class for these guys here for two weeks. Nicholas, I'm going to be in Valdez on the 14th for class, and I'm going to bring down all the artifacts. Will you be there that day? Uh, uh, yeah? Oh, are you asking if I will be there? I thought you were just telling me to be there. Well, but yes, I'll be there. <laughs> okay, great. Because <laughs> I, I don't want to come to Valdez and, and ha not have you there. And Robin, we'll try to figure out a way for, that you can get to see everything. Okay, um, this is another picture of the crematorium ovens, and you can see the tracks. Okay. The picture of the crematorium ovens. Okay, and the tracks lead, uh, you know, they're they're like railroad tracks almost, so you can bring people in and out uh, in Auschwitz. This, and I have to tell you that I am, these slides are, I am very, um, I bring my personal emotions into these slides because it was a very, very, very powerful place for me uh, when I went to visit Auschwitz and Birkenau. Um, I had a 10-year-old, a 7-year-old, and a 5-year-old here, and I actually had to stop looking in the museums when we hit the one where they were, had been uh, doing the experiments on the children. Um, I was like, okay, I'm done. I'm done. I can't handle any more of this. <laughs> um, this is the gas chamber that they weren't able to destroy. And this gas chamber, if you look at the walls, you can see claw marks on the walls. It's pretty chilling. And I guess we'll end there because we don't have any. We don't have any fun slides from Auschwitz. Sorry. because it's not a fun place.